All right, so we are going to have some fun and go over some unknown cases in abdominal infections. So what we're going to do is a case-based format, and we're going to talk about um, the key features and some of the differential uh, diagnoses. All right, case one. We have an 18-year-old male from Guatemala who presents with right lower quadrant pain and some images from his ultrasound exam. Let's just do that again. And this is his follow-up CT, the same patient, 18-year-old from uh, Guatemala. Based on the images and ultrasound and CT, what is the most likely cause of the small bowel findings? And there is an audience response question. Do I advance with this? No, it's not, it didn't give me the audience response. Well, you got it anyway. Ascariasis is indeed the um, answer. And it is the most common worm infection that we have worldwide. It's, it accounts for 25% of all the infections in the world um, in developing countries, particularly in children. And uh, it is a very common cause of small bowel obstructions in the children in the world. Um, and the treatment is to have uh, any uh, uh, helminthic drugs to uh, take care of this. But what happens is after these are seen by imaging, many of the patients either vomit the worms or um, actually have it go through the bathroom um, by stooling it. So that's one of the features that um, basically confirms this. And this young child or 18-year-old actually vomited after the CAT scan. Um, to confirm the diagnosis. Here's uh, another patient, 25-year-old patient with, uh, from India, and you can see the worms that are in uh, the gut. And what happens with on barium is when you do fluoroscopy study, the worms swallow the barium. And the intestinal tract of the barium is highlighted by white. And you can see that um, these are the worms by uh, fluoroscopy. Here um, are other patients uh, with ascariasis, and the worms actually live off the fecal stream. They live off the gut, um, and when they swallow the barium, like we say, the gut, the in intestines become quite white um, on the fluoroscopy, and these are all real patients that we have seen in our institutions. Case two. 38-year-old male presents with penile and scrotal swelling. And you have select images from uh, MRI exam. You have coronal and axial T2-weighted fat sat images as well as a sagittal stir image. Based on the imaging of this young male, what is the most likely diagnosis of his infection? Is this a silicon form body reaction? Is this Staphylococcus aureus? Is this condyloma? Or neurofibroma?
Okay, so we have a kind of a division between condyloma and silicon, and it's good. Let's talk about this. All right, this is a giant condyloma. This is uh, HPV, uh, papillomavirus, and it can affect any part of the anogenital tract. When it becomes this giant form, the verrucous uh, type component, uh, they call it the Bushke Lowenstein tumor, it is typically associated with squamous cell carcinoma. It's large, it's slowly growing, it looks like a cauliflower in its growth, and that's why we call it uh, cauliflower growth. Um, they are uh, either taken care of by radiation or um, radical surgery, but they have a very high recurrence rate uh, for it. And it is highly associated with HIV um, with this HPV super infection. It can be quite extensive. Uh, this is a different patient with giant condyloma uh, um, where you could see that it could be quite problematic for uh, treatment as it's involving the entire anal genital tract. This patient uh, actually went on for um, extensive radiotherapy, uh, which then um, did uh, succumb for uh, recurrence. Another patient with a giant condyloma, and you could see it is part of the uh, HPV uh, 16 to 18, and we call it you know, the genital warts that went crazy uh, to it, and it is associated with HIV and its um, risk for squamous cell carcinoma. This is a giant condyloma with associated squamous cell carcinoma of uh, the buttocks. It can involve the entire uh, genital to urinary tract, and the urethra is something that is commonly seen, um, and we saw in the, from MRI using uh, on um, the penile, but you could see the urethra can be quite involved with diffuse uh, involvement of nodular defects as well as uh, mucosal change. Another patient um, that has extensive uh, scrotal involvement uh, with uh, HPV, and you could see how it, it could be quite problematic and how you can figure out if there's a tumor in this or if this is associated with um, uh, you know, superimposed squamous cell and it many uh, times has uh, multiple biopsies to confirm that it's just not HPV related. All right, differential is the siliconoma, um, which can uh, result in extensive uh, necrosis and necrotizing uh, in, in inflammation to uh, the penis. This is a, a big problem in uh, males who undergo penile augmentation. And if uh, they use a clear and pure silicon, usually not a problem. But when you go, when these uh, uh, men go to smaller medical places, uh, the places usually mix it with a mix of mineral oils and paraffin, and that mixture is what gives the big problem with necrosis and inflammation. And as you can imagine, it, it can be quite uh, problematic where, uh, for example, this young man who's 25 years old had to have three surgeries um, to uh, get rid of the uh, necrotic tissue of his uh, penis. All right, case three. 91-year-old female, she presents into the emergency room with acute abdominal pain and fever. And we have select images uh, from her abdomen. So the first question is, what is the source of the aortic error for this 91-year-old female? Is it a mycotic aneurysm? Is it underlying colon carcinoma? Is it aortoenteric fistula? Or is it appendicitis? Nice division here, mycotic aneurysm, colon cancer, and AE fistula. All right, second question to this. What is the infection related to the aortic air? Is this clostridium? Is this Klebsiella? 
Is it Pseudomonas or is it Staphylococcus? Good, so this is Clostridium septicum. Okay, so this is a uh, very interesting um, infection. Uh, it is something that's been associated with uh, colon masses and hematologic malignancies when uh, the gas uh, gets involved and gets into the bloodstream. This was a case actually we wrote up because um, we did uh, see her coming into our emergency room. You could see that there is uh, gas within the wall of um, the aorta and iliac vessels, but there was a large uh, mass in uh, that right uh, colon. And it is a gram-positive uh, organism. It's an anaerobe. It's not fungal, but it really acts like a fungus. Um, it's not thought to be in our normal gut, but for some reason it's seen in uh, appendiceal resections. So for some reason um, it's believed that this bug super colonizes or super infects in the setting of right-sided colon cancer. So in normal appendices, they've been seen up to 63% of resection. But not um, the extensive colonization, but only 1% of them go on to have um, significant infection. And if it's seen in the bloodstream, just like Streptococcus bovis is what we remember for those bugs that are associated with colon cancer, um, if it's seen in the bloodstream, it is uh, very highly associated with GI or hematologic malignancy and uh, should be uh, thought of um, and looked for. The second case we saw very similarly, you could see uh, that this patient was quite sick. Um, she has uh, uh, polycystic kidney disease. She had extensive gas in uh, the aortic wall, but she had this ugly situation happening in the right lower quadrant. Um, and we uh, thought it was an ill-defined mass uh, to it, but indeed uh, that was a uh, perforated uh, cecal cancer that had seeded or superimposed infection from Clostridia that then went on to um, uh, involve the wall. Other Clostridia infections that we saw yesterday um, with extensive gas-forming uh, components to uh, the parenchyma of uh, the viscera. Case four, 58-year-old male with elevated liver function enzymes. We have select images from his ultrasound. And this is the follow-up MRI for the same gentleman who presents after his ultrasound. So you have uh, pre-contrast images and post-contrast dynamic images and T2-weighted imaging and diffusion. So based on the ultrasound and MRI features, what is the most likely infection that can be causing this finding? Is this schistosomiasis? Is this histoplasmosis? Is this candidiasis or pseudomomans? Okay, so schistosomiasis versus histoplasmosis. And this indeed is uh, schistosomiasis. And the bug that we want to think about um, that uh, likes uh, the liver is schistosoma uh, mensoni or schistosoma japonicum. And it's believed uh, to be associated with exposure to contaminated water, particularly um, in uh, the Middle East. So it's believed that the eggs uh, laid in the mesenteric veins and then eventually are taken up by the portal system 
um, into the liver. And it causes a significant granulomatous uh, reaction to the liver um, where then the, the, it, the bug or the egg is encapsulated by the granulomatous reaction around it. And most of them um, present acutely and not so much chronically with a cirrhotic appearance, but acutely with a, a tender enlarged liver in the most of the cases. An ultrasound, uh, the features is uh, believed to be uh, caused by periportal fibrosis where you have the anechoic uh, portal veins surrounded by the linear tracts of fibrosis. It's called the bullseye appearance. But you can see the separation by the fibrous bands uh, and linear uh, component due to the fibrosis laid uh, by the eggs and response to the granulomatous change. It is what we call the turtle back appearance on imaging where these linear bands of uh, fibrosis um, can calcify. And these are, this is a non-contrast exam in this uh, patient. You can see the linear bands of calcification. Again, the granulomatous response that encapsulates uh, the eggs uh, resulting in this whatever tortoise shell turtle back appearance uh, to the liver. We know about cystosomiasis in the GU tract. This is hematobium. This is more that you see uh, from Egypt where uh, the, uh, the eggs are laid um, into the bladder wall and again, capsulated by calcification um, along uh, the uh, urothelium and then eventually having an increased risk for, um, for uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And it's kind of interesting where um, the reports of cystosomiasis lays back, way back in the past because they are finding eggs recovered from mummies when they're doing um, their uh, complete dissections now. All right, case five. 32-year-old female presents with left lower quadrant pain and fever. And we have select images from her abdomen and pelvis, post-contrast images, T2 weighted, and a diffusion with ADC. So what is the finding of the liver due to? Is it blood? Is it capsular perihepatitis? Is it a laceration? Or is it tumor? Great, perihepatitis, so this is from the talk. Uh, yesterday. What is the most likely diagnosis based on the images? Is this Fitzy Curtis, appendicitis, ovarian carcinoma, or Kuchenberg tumors? This is Fitzy Curtis, uh, the perihepatitis associated with uh, extensive pelvic inflammatory disease. Very nicely outlined here, showing you the marked diffusion restriction in the tubal ovarian abscesses, where the bugs then exude out and um, go out into the right perihepatic um, space. So it's, it's really defined as inflammation of the capsule of the liver, and it's believed to uh, result from infection uh, arising from the pelvis. And as the patient lays down, these exudates um, extend from the diaphragm to the liver, causing significant um, uh, diaphragmatic um, inflammation and scarring. Here's another patient with uh, extensive pelvic inflammatory disease. You can see that uh, uh, the adnexa are markedly inflamed. There's ex exuberant um, inflammation to the anterior pelvic fat. And as uh, if you were to do a late arterial phase, you can see nicely the capsular rind of enhancement uh, due to the perihepatitis extensive disease in this case. Case six, let's see if the movie works. So 
So this is a 71-year-old uh, female who presents with fever after recent travel to India. Let me do that one more time. And this is the follow-up MRI of that patient. NCT, post-contrast images, T2 diffusion-weighted, and correlative CT. So based on the images, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is this high dadded? Is this hepatocellular carcinoma? Is this fasciola? Or is this ascariasis? Great, this is indeed fasciola. Fasciola hepatica that basically burrows into uh, the liver parenchyma from uh, central to peripherally. And again, it is an ingestion of a parasite which uh, travels from the gut and extends uh, uh, beyond the intestine into uh, getting into the peritoneal surface and then uh, extends and burrows through the capsule of the liver. And the features are they usually present with eosinophilia, and then after the eosinophilia, we start looking for the source of it. And it is usually, again, intestinal involvement, so it is based by looking for the eggs in the stool. Um, the acute phase is, again, very similar to schistosoma, where they have painful uh, hepatomegaly. And in the chronic phases, uh, it's due to the um, biliary obstruction by these worms. And you can see that they're usually in a linear tract from the periphery to the central, from the central to the periphery, but usually periphery to central because the eggs then, or the parasite, extends from the capsule and burrows uh, centrally. So you're looking for these cluster of hypodense lesions with peripheral enhancement. And again, you try to see the linear tract burrowing uh, through it uh, associated with the dilated or involved uh, biliary tract. These are all patients with diffuse fasciola um, through uh, the liver. It can be quite mass-like, and you can see how problematic it is, and many times they end up doing biopsies um, and when it's not known when these uh, patients present um, to uh, the liver service. Here um, are other patients with fasciola. Again, the linear uh, parameter of it, the tracts of from the periphery to, I mean, from the uh, glistens capsule centrally, very classic of this uh, parasite. Uh, again, I'm not sure if you see it in Spain, but you may see it from your immigrants that do uh, come from um, Asia. All right, case seven. 29 year old female who presents to the emergency room with several weeks of painful abdominal mass. We'll just go through that again. She's 29. And this is her follow-up MRI. T2-weighted images, post-contrast images. Based on her uh, CT and her age and the MRI, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is this uh, epithelial carcinoma? Is this actinomycosis? Is this a lymphoma? Or is this Kuchenberg tumor?
Great, actinomycosis. All right, so this is, again, a, a gram positive. It, look, it's, it acts like a fungus, but it's not a fungus, and it's something that we have in our normal flora in, the, in our mouth and in our gut, um, and it usually is a bug that behaves. It does not cross uh, the boundaries, and I, 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 I say that it usually behaves and does not cross the mucosa borders unless there is hypoxemia. And the hypoxemia, by definition, we know with after neck surgery or after chest wall surgery, you can get um, involvement of actinomycosis. Well, the presence of an IUD in itself um, allows for colonization of actinomycosis uh, with a small percentage of um, infection that ensues. Keep in mind that when you start seeing uh, crossing of the fascial planes, um, through abdominal wall, through the soft tissues. Cancers don't do that. That's not a feature of cancer. It's usually a feature of something that's necrotizing like pancreatitis or actinomycosis, something that can dissect through uh, the abdominal wall. You have to think more that this is an ugly infection rather uh, than a cancer uh, in terms of that. So again, remember that IUDs in, it, in, in itself are colonized uh, by uh, actinomycosis. And again, the fascial plane extensive involvement through the abdominal wall, very classic of what this bug can do. And look how ugly and problematic this can be for that patient. It still requires a GYN oncologist to resect it. It's a big debulking surgery from the colon and uh, the uterus when um, the infection is this big. And remember, she, for example, is only 29 years old. Um, another uh, patient with extensive um, active mycosis, you could see the IUD is a long-term Libby's loop, copper loop that's in this older patient um, and exuberant uh, uh, in pelvic infection within um, the abdomen. I'm just going to end with a quick bonus case. It's a 44-year-old male with HIV and who presents with three months of bilateral testicular swelling. So you have the right testes and right epididymis, and you have the left testes and left epididymis. 44-year-old male. And these are more images up higher where we scanned into the retroperitoneum. You can see the periodic area in retroperitoneum and even in the inguinal area. And this is the follow-up MRI of this patient. Okay, so based on all the imaging we have, we had ultrasound, we have MRI, what is the most likely diagnosis in this HIV patient? Is this sarcoid? Is this tuberculosis? Is this histo? Or is this capacies? And this indeed is tuberculosis. And you could see the extensive involvement of both epididymis and uh, testes in this patient. And I love Spain. Thank you so much for having me.